Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's great to see lots of people came out despite threats of snowflakes. Uh, Tim Wise is actually uh, an American who hails from the southern U.S. and uh, Nashville in particular, and I think he thought it might be spring up here in March, but um, <laughs> at lunch today we taught him a new word called nor'easter. <laughs> and so he might get a chance to see one of those for himself. Um, so good evening. Um, I would like actually to begin um, by acknowledging that we are on the traditional Mi'kmaq lands of the Mi'kma'hi, the ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I know many of you. Um, I'm Christine Hansen, the CEO of the Human Rights Commission. Today, as you know, is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And I think it's important to say that it's not enough that we focus on elimination of racial discrimination for just one day. We have to fight racism every day. Uh, racism is more than unacceptable. In fact, it is illegal under the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act to discriminate against someone based on their race. Racism, I can tell you from having been in this perch for two years now, is a problem in Nova Scotia. We've seen lots of evidence of racism here in Nova Scotia. It manifests itself in the unfair treatment of individuals by others based on their race. Uh, we also find it in institutions and systems. So I think part of the talk tonight, it's really important that we collectively take responsibility for addressing racism. Uh, the closer uh, we'll get to eliminating it in all its forms. Um, to combat racism, it's really critical that those who are not persons of color uh, serve as allies, using our privileges, our power, and our influence to champion anti-racism efforts. So before we introduce our guest speaker, uh, who is going to share his wisdom with us regarding ways we can all become better allies in the fight against racism, I am going to turn the stage over to Minister Tony Ince, who is going to deliver a few remarks. Thank you. Minister, please. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Um, before I begin, uh, I'd also, too, like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional Mi'kmaq lands of the Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. I'd also like to welcome a few of my colleagues who are here, uh, Minister Diab from uh, Minister of Immigration, Minister Fiore, Minister of Justice, Councillor Craig as well, and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Jason McLean from the NSGEU, President of the NSGEU. Thank you all for being here. I would like to also say thank you so much for being here. And, and this is a day that's very important as we recognize the United Nations International Day to eliminate racial discrimination. Every person is entitled to human rights without discrimination. Today, Nova Scotians are joining people from around the world to take a stand against racism, discrimination, prejudice, and related intolerance. Nova Scotia is an acknowledged leader as a place where culture, identity, expression, and economy prosper. Our province's culture is rich and varied, reflecting the diversity and heritage of our people and a strong sense of its past. However, systemic racism and discrimination are still a reality for many Nova Scotians. Communities such as the Mi'kmaq and Indigenous Nova Scotians, African Nova Scotians, and newcomers are victims of racism. We all need to acknowledge and recognize the existence of racism and how it impacts our communities. We must put aside our differences and work together to eliminate racism, intolerance, discrimination, and judgment from our lives. Our government is equally committed to the United Nations stand on racism and discrimination. 
We want a province where all Nova Scotians are treated with dignity, equality, and respect, and have access to the opportunities our communities have to offer. Earlier today, Premier McNeil proclaimed today as the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination in the Province of Nova Scotia. I would like to read the proclamation on his behalf. Whereas March 21st is the United Nations International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, a day for people around the world to take a stand against racism, discrimination, prejudice, and related intolerance in all its forms, and whereas the government of Nova Scotia has committed to addressing systemic racism and discrimination and is actively working across government to achieve this goal. And whereas Nova Scotia will only be the best province it can be if we work together to eliminate systemic racism and discrimination and to ensure all Nova Scotians are treated with dignity, equality, and respect while having access to all of the opportunities that this great province has to offer. Therefore, be it resolved that I, Stephen McNeil, Premier of Nova Scotia, do hereby proclaim March 21st, 2018, as International Day for the Elimination of Racism in the province of Nova Scotia and encourage all Nova Scotians to put aside our differences to acknowledge the existence of racism and its impacts and work together to eliminate it. In doing so, we will create a meaning, meaningful change and a better future for all Nova Scotians. Now, I, I would be honored to present this proclamation to Eunice Harker, Chair of the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commissions. Thank you all. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kesa Monroe Anderson, and I'm the Manager of Race Relations, Equity, and Inclusion with the Nova Scotia Human Rights Commission. I wish to thank you all very much for being here tonight. A few notes prior to the introduction of Tim Wise. First, we look forward to seeing you after the lecture. We welcome you to stay here with us as we'll have a short reception just following, and that will be just directly across in the faculty lounge. So please stay around and um, join us for some eats and also perhaps have a, an opportunity to mingle and meet Mr. Wise as well. Secondly, we invite you to join in the conversation online. We're at NS Human Rights, all one word, on Twitter and on Instagram. The hashtag is Fight Racism. This talk is also being recorded for educational purposes and will be available on our YouTube page. We are very pleased to have Tim Wise speak with us this evening. Among the most prominent anti-racist writers and educators in the United States, Tim Wise has spent the past 25 years speaking to audiences across the United States. A published author of seven books, including his highly acclaimed memoir, White Like Me, Reflections on Race from a Privileged Son, he is also the host of the new podcast, Speak Out with Tim Wise. Wise has lectured internationally in Canada and Bermuda, and has trained corporate, government, entertainment, media, law enforcement, military, and medical industry professionals on methods for dismantling racism in their institutions. He's also provided anti-racism training to educators and administrators nationwide in the US. 
Wise has been featured in several documentaries and appeared alongside legendary scholar and activist Angela Davis in the 2011 documentary, Vocabulary of Change. Wise appears regularly on CNN and MSNBC to discuss race issues. However, tonight, we have the honor of hearing, hearing him speak in person. So please join me in extending a warm welcome back to Nova Scotia, Tim Wise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so first I want to say I'm not at all sweating the weather here, and let me tell you why. Um, I sort of planned this. The whole plan was I was going to come to Canada, you guys were going to get a horrible storm, I was going to get stuck, and I think there's like an international law that says if you get stranded in another country for like four days, they have to grant you asylum. <laughs> and since I live in the United States, that shit sort of matters to me right about now. So uh, it's all going to plan. I just need about four inches of snow, and uh, I'll be here, you know, through the weekend. And by Monday, you'll have to let somebody's going to have to sponsor me. It's just the way it works. That's it. I got a bunch of ministers in here. Somebody's going to have to sponsor me. I'm I'm going to send for my family. They're just going to come up, you know. And we're just going to call it a day and start over. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for uh, for being here as well. And um, you know, I want to start off by saying that, um, although I'm joking a little bit about, obviously, the state of the situation in the United States, you know sort of what's going on, I assume, you know, uh, you've seen the news, you sort of know where we're at. But I do want to suggest, in the midst of that, that while our crisis uh, in the United States with regard to a lot of things might be a little bit more acute and a little bit more obvious and a little bit more blatant in some ways right now, just because of the the ramped up nature of our current administration and the way in which uh, that administration addresses or fails to address issues of race and racial equity. Um, in spite of the fact that our crisis may be more acute, the chronic condition of life um, in Canada and the United States and really all throughout North America for a very long time has been a chronic condition of white supremacy and a chronic condition of racial inequity. So even when it might be more acute in one part of a continent than another, and it might be more in the news in one part of a continent than the other, it really doesn't suggest that the problem is necessarily greater in one part of the continent than the other, or that um, those who are in a different part of the continent can afford to be smug. And I guess what I'm saying is don't be smug, Canada. I love you, um, and I know you pray for me. But but the reality is that this problem that I'm here to address um, is not the American problem, the United States problem. Uh, it is a global problem of white supremacy. It is certainly a continent-wide problem of white supremacy. And it is a problem that we all have to address uh, in one capacity or another. So here we have this International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. And we have to ask ourselves on a day like this, and really any day, how we do that and what we mean when we use those words. What are we talking about when we discuss the desire to eliminate racial discrimination? Um, see, what worries me in the last year or so in my country, there are a lot of things that worry me, but among the things that worry me, other than the obvious, that is to say the uptick and the upsurge in overt xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment, the uh, upsurge and uptick in overt hate crime and hate group activity, right, which we certainly see in our country. The other thing that concerns me is that in the midst of all that, as bad as that is, the worst thing about it is that it allows everyone who isn't part of that problem, who isn't a hate group member, who isn't a neo-Nazi, who isn't a white supremacist, it allows all of the rest of us to sort of get distance from the problem, right? It allows the rest of white America, and I would suggest as well, white Canada and the white West in general, right? These other nice white people, God love us, right? I don't mean the horrible white supremacist, white nationalist, neo-Nazi, Ku Klux Klan, cross-burning, overt, hateful people. I mean the nice white, quote unquote, liberal people to get distance from it and to act like, well, that's not us. Thank God we're not like that, right? Thank God those are the bad people over there and we're the good people, right? And the more overt hostility that you have, the easier it is to get distance from it. The easier it is to put distance between yourself and that and to convince yourself that the problem is out there. It's someone else's problem. 
and we can sort of cluck our tongues and we can point at the white supremacist and the neo-Nazis like those young men in Charlottesville, Virginia back in August, you'll recall the tiki torch wielding uh, members of the American white nationalist movement. Because I think you'll agree with me, nothing says white supremacy like a bunch of 23-year-olds in khakis and polo shirts with oversized Polynesian candles. It's sort of a <laughs> Pier 1 riot in a way, right? Um, nothing, nothing says white power, you know, more than that. Um, when you look at people like that, though, right, it becomes easy for the rest of us to get distance. And the problem is none of those individuals, just like none of the overt white supremacists throughout Europe and none of the overt white supremacists in Canada, they're not the ones who are responsible for the wealth disparities between white folk and black folk, between white folk and First Nations and indigenous peoples. Right? David Duke and all these other white supremacists and neo-Nazis in my country, they're not to blame for the fact that black folks are three and a half times more likely than white folks to be shot by police while unarmed. They don't have badges and guns. David Duke is not the sheriff. Neo-Nazis, at least not in a formal sense, they're not the ones who run the law enforcement system. By the same token, it's not overt neo-Nazis who are responsible for the fact that right here in this province, you have street checks of black folks in this province that are, what, three times, is my understanding, as common as they are for white folks, can't be explained by differential crime rates, can't be explained by demographics, right? That data is going to be coming out very soon. You're going to see, if you don't already know, what it suggests. That's not white supremacist in the overt sense. You know what I mean? That's not the organized hate movement, but that's the system that we all live in which is to say that we're all responsible for doing something for it. And we can't afford to try to put distance between ourselves and that. The disparities that exist in the educational system, the disparities that exist in terms of income and wealth, the disparities that exist in terms of health outcomes, the disparities that exist in terms of housing access and opportunity, the disparities that exist in the justice system, those are systemic and Nazis are not to blame for them. So while we sometimes would prefer to talk about the horrible, evil people on the extremes, let's remember that what passes for mainstream, what passes for acceptable loss and acceptable inequality, that which we rationalize every day is destroying lives and is stunting people's opportunity. And so we have to take some responsibility for that. We can't afford to get distance. We're all part of the culture of inequality that has been rationalized for far too long. Now, when I say that we're responsible, I want to be very clear in differentiating that from a sense of guilt, because I know that when we talk about these things, those of us who are white in particular, and called white in this and so many other cultures now, um, we tend to get very defensive. I know my people well. I've been white for a long time. And one thing that I know about my people is that we are very defensive when the issue of racism is raised because we believe that when the issue is raised, we are personally being called racist and therefore we are being called bad people and therefore we are being asked to feel guilty for a system that we did not create. Listen to me now. If you learn nothing else this evening, if you come away with no other lesson whatsoever, please know this. Guilt and responsibility are not the same thing. They are not synonyms by any stretch of the linguistic imagination. Guilt is something you feel for the stuff you've actually done. Responsibility is something you take because of the kind of person that you are. That is not the same thing. We take responsibility for things all the time that we didn't necessarily cause to happen. Right? Think about environmental pollution. Right? I don't think anyone in this room, at least I hope, this is the case. I hope no one in this room is personally responsible for belching toxic waste into the atmosphere via your own smokestack in your backyard. I hope that none of you took toxic waste and injected it into the streams and the rivers and the ocean and the creeks and all of the water table that exists in your country, just like those in my country, I hope, did not do that. We did not personally poison the air, the land, and the soil with toxic chemicals, and yet it has happened anyway, hasn't it? And we are responsible for addressing that and for cleaning up that damage, even if we did not, strictly speaking, cause it. That's the difference between guilt and responsibility, between being blameworthy and taking responsibility for the world as you find it. You take responsibility for the world as you find it, not because you caused it to be as it is, but because you are here and it is as it is. And if you don't clean it, it doesn't get cleaned. And of course, we don't have any problem taking advantage of the results of past actions. We just don't like to take responsibility for the bad part. We like the good part. In my country, we certainly do. We, we love it. You know, July 4th, right, is our Independence Day. We have a big 
parade and we set off fireworks and we eat hot dogs and eat apple pie and wave the flag on July 4th in remembrance of some stuff that happened a really long time ago that none of us were involved in, right? Like, we broke away from the British a long-ass time ago. That was not last Tuesday, right? And yet we're still setting off fireworks, taking advantage of all the benefits of that independence. We just don't want to deal with the downside. So we're not even really consistent, are we, when we say we don't want to feel guilty. We like the upside. We just don't like to deal with the down. And that's true of every society. Mine, yours, probably every society on earth. But the difference between guilt and responsibility came home to me in the clearest way, not from studying this subject or even thinking about it. It happened when I was right out of college. I'll tell you this story, sort of make the point, so you can graphically understand what I mean about taking responsibility even for things that you didn't cause. In this case, the racial disparities that plague your society and mine and the system of white supremacy that has plagued the West for far too long. Uh, when I graduated from college, I thought for reasons that I'm still not clear on almost 30 years later, that it would be a fantastic idea to move into a very large house with nine other people. Uh, let me give you a little life advice in case you didn't already know this. If it is possible to avoid living in a large house with nine other people, you should do that shit. You should not live in a house with nine other people. Like, you should just try and avoid that. Just don't do it. I thought it would be great, though, because, you know, well, first of all, we thought it would be great because we were broke. And when you're broke, you'll do some crazy stuff, like live in a house with nine other people, because you will save money. And we certainly were going to save money. Didn't matter, we figured, if we got along, right? Because we're just going to save some dough. We can save up enough money. Six months later, maybe a year later, we can just get our own place. Because rent was like 525 a month. I don't mean per person, y'all. I mean total. <laughs> Even in 1990, y'all, that was good money. Some of y'all can remember, some of you don't. Trust me, 5250 a month per person was good. Good, right? Even when you added the utility bills and the grocery bill, because we split the grocery bills, everything, right? There was, no, I mean, there was a cable bill, but there wasn't internet. You know, we didn't have any of that. You add all those bills together, less than $100 a month. So on that level, it was a pretty good deal. $100 a month or less per person, and uh, thought it'd be great. Well, about six months in, I realized why this was such a terrible, horrible idea. And this is how I found this out. I was working downtown in New Orleans at the time. I graduated from Tulane in New Orleans in May of 1990. And so later that year, I'm working downtown in the uh, campaign against David Duke, former Klan leader, white supremacist, uh, lifelong, really, since uh, young adulthood, really late teenage years, lifelong neo-Nazi, who was running for the United States Senate at that time and then governor of Louisiana. And I came home from work one afternoon, one early evening, got on the streetcar, got off the streetcar, uh, walked the four blocks into the house, went up the stairs, um, opened the door, and I was met by this incredible smell. And I mean that in a good way, which I just want to clarify, because when you live with nine other people, there are often smells. Uh, they are often not good. Uh, this one was actually good. It was the smell of dinner being made on the left front burner of that stove in the kitchen. It was a big pot of gumbo. One of my roommates was making gumbo because it's New Orleans, y'all, and that's what we do, right? And man, it smelled good good and it looked good. It even had seafood, not much like I said we were broke, but it had like three shrimp. <laughs> three, those little bitty ass shrimp. You're like the shrimp that make popcorn shrimp look like jumbo shrimp. The shrimp that make jumbo shrimp look like lobster. Some of y'all know the kind of shrimp I'm talking about. We were broke, but man, we felt rich that night because we were going to have gumbo with shrimp in it. And the guy says to me, hey man, you want some? And I was so tempted because it looked so good and it smelled so good. But actually I said, look man, I, I gotta tell you, I already ate downtown before I came back up. I didn't know you were making gumbo. If I'd known, I would have waited, but I didn't know, so I didn't wait. So do me a favor, save some of it, put it in some Tupperware, whatever, in a container. I'll, I'll, take, it to, uh, I'll take it to work tomorrow for lunch because it looks great. He said, okay, uh, I'll do that. I said, cool. So I went upstairs and hung out with the roommates, did whatever we did for fun in 1990. There wasn't much, y'all. Uh, social networking, 1990 was pretty much, you just walked down the hall to your roommate's room. You were like, what you doing? They were like, Nothing, it's 1990, go back to sleep, man. Just get back in like 15 years, we'll have some shit to do. But right now we got nothing, like just go away. That was social networking, right? Um, so I go to bed sort of early, because we all did back in the Stone Ages, and I wake up the next morning at about seven o'clock, I come downstairs to get some coffee. And I notice, as I'm getting my coffee, that still on the left front burner of that stove, right, it's still this pot of gumbo. And man, it did not smell as good as it had the night before, and it definitely didn't look as good. And I was upset for two reasons. Number one, because 
The guy that made it had not saved any of it for me, and I certainly wasn't going to eat it now because it had been there overnight. And secondly, he hadn't cleaned it, so he just left the mess. So he didn't save it, so now it's going to waste, and he didn't clean it, so now somebody else is going to have to do it, maybe me. And so I wasn't real pleased, but it was early and he wasn't up yet, and I thought, well, I should wake him up, you know? I should just wake him up. But then I thought, no, forget it, man. I'll take it up with him when I get home. I'm just going to clean it. So I take the pot of gumbo. I take it off the left front burner of the stove. I bring it over to the sink. I start to run the water. I get the soap. I get the scrub brush. Get some gloves because it was pretty nasty. I don't really want to touch it, you know? Start to run the water into the pot of gumbo, right? And just about two seconds before I actually started to scrub the thing, I stopped myself and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have to clean this. I didn't make this mess. Hell, I didn't even eat any of this. Right? This is not my fault. Now I felt really self-righteous and incredibly intelligent because I was talking myself out of doing the hard work, which is a skill I learned in college, just so you know. <laughs> so I take the pot of gumbo and I very self-righteously put it right back on the left front burner of the stove and I go off to work right, with my head held high. I didn't get suckered into cleaning someone else's mess. I come back that night about 6.30. I notice that one of my other roommates is making dinner on the right front burner of the stove. But on the left front burner, right where it had been now for 24 hours, is the same pot of gumbo getting even nastier, more disgusting, more crusted on the side of the pot. I look at my roommate like he's some kind of fool, and I said, how is it that you are going to cook on the right front burner of this stove when I'm fairly confident you can smell last night's dinner on the left front burner because it's right under your nostril? Why didn't you clean that? He looked at me and said, hey, man, I didn't make this mess. In fact, I wasn't even here for dinner last night. Did you make this? Did you have any? I'm like, hey, man, don't look at me. He said, all right, then. You want some lentils and rice? And I said, very self-righteously, because we both knew now that we weren't going to clean the night before his mess. I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I would. And I ate my lentils and rice. I cleaned the dishes. I put them in the dish dryer, went back up to my room, hung out with the roommates, listened to music, watched TV, whatever it is we did for fun in 1990. Once again, went to bed sort of early. Uh, the next morning I get up, I'd forgotten to set an alarm. But here's a tip. If you're living in a house where there's a pot of gumbo sitting on the left front burner of your stove, 36 and a half hours after it was originally made, you are not going to need an alarm clock to wake you up because the smell is going to crawl out of the pot of gumbo on the legs that it grew overnight as a process of evolution, and it is going to crawl across the living room floor, go up the stairs, down the hallway, go under your door frame, and find with the precision of a laser that thing on the front of your face you call a nose, and now you will be awake. And I was, and I was pissed because I knew what was waiting for me on the left front burner of that stove, having not been cleaned by anybody, least of all the guy that made the mess. So I throw my door open, I'm stomping down the hall, trying, trying to wake people up just to let them know of my displeasure. I live with nine other people, can't find anybody. They've all disappeared. The guy that made the gumbo is like, where's Waldo? Nobody knows where in the hell he went. He just made the gumbo as a practical joke and then skipped town to see if anybody else would clean up his mess. I get downstairs to the bottom of the stairs. I look across the living room into the kitchen. I see the gumbo, and I am fairly confident, even though it has been almost 30 years, that the gumbo saw me, <laughs> taunted me a minute, right? And it was then that I came to understand the most important lesson that I had ever learned about any subject and not just household cleanliness, right? And what was the lesson? The lesson was it didn't really matter anymore, did it? Whether I had made the mess. The only thing that mattered is I was tired of living in that funk, in that nastiness, in the residue of somebody else's actions, actions for which I was not to blame, but actions that were now affecting my quality of life and the quality of life of everybody in that space. And the same is true with human society. When we get tired of living in the nastiness, in the funk, in the residue of history, then we'll clean up the mess, not because we caused it, but because we're the only ones left, right? That's the difference between guilt and responsibility. And if we can't wrap our head around that, then we're just not ready for this conversation and we're not really ready for the modern era. So what does it mean then to do that with some sense of certitude and accountability and um, determinative action? What does it mean to be an ally? What does that really require? Because all of us are in a position from time to time to be allies, that is to say, to be co-conspirators, collaborators with those who lead this struggle. For those of us who are white, in a racial sense, that means allying ourselves and becoming co-conspirators with folks of color who fight white supremacy, but everyone 
has a role to play as allies, those of us who were men, as allies to women fighting patriarchy, misogyny, rape culture, sexism, et cetera, those of us who were straight or cisgendered, becoming allies and co-collaborators and co-conspirators with those who were LGBTQ fighting straight supremacy, heterosexism, transphobia, cisgendered supremacy, those of us who were able-bodied, uh, fighting with those with disabilities as allies, as co-collaborators against ableism, you know what I mean, on down the list, every one of us has some identity where we're the dominant group. I've never been in a room yet where there was anyone who didn't have at least one identity category where they were the dominant group, right? And if you are a dominant group in any category at all, that is where you need to be an ally. So these remarks, although I aim them at white folks with regard to race, they apply to everyone. And the logic of allyship and co-collaborator, co-conspirator uh, mentalities can apply to any of us when we're in that role. The first thing we have to do in order to be more effective allies or co-conspirators in fighting systemic injustice is we have to have the humility to recognize that this conversation and the work that needs to be done, it isn't personal. And I think sometimes we get tripped up on that because the assumption is if we're talking about racism, we're calling people racist. This is not about you. If we're talking about sexism and patriarchy, it's not about you. It's about a system of inequality. If we're talking about a class system, it ain't about you. I mean, it is, but it's not. You know what I mean? It's about you and it's about all of us in the sense that we have an obligation to do something, but it's not about assigning blame. Systems operate on their own logic. They don't require bad people to sit there behind the curtain like Oz in The Wizard of Oz pulling the strings, right? After a while, systems have their own internal logic. They operate on autopilot. I was talking today with folks about the issue of racism in the realm of employment within the province. And one of the things that I was talking about there, you know, we think of discrimination, and this is the day for the elimination of discrimination, this UN declared day. We think of discrimination as something people do consciously and deliberately because they're bad people who don't like certain folks, and so they treat them badly as a result of their identity, and that's certainly a piece of it. But what we also know is that in a market economy of competition, we also have a lot of jobs that are filled, be they in the private sector or the government sector or the NGO sector, right? By way of what? Not qualifications and open competition, but by way of networking, by way of who we know, not what we know, and those networks are oftentimes far more open, of course, to those who are white, to those who are men, to those who are upper middle class or affluent, to those who are straight, to those who are able-bodied, went to the right colleges, blah, 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 you know the story. And so that doesn't require bad people, right? You could have institutions with no overt bigots, no haters, no, no racist and sexist in the overt sense, who nonetheless, just by virtue of doing business the way they've always done business, right, will continue to perpetuate inequality. So we have to have a more capacious understanding of how systems operate rather than thinking it's about bad person A doing something to good person B. Right? You can actually have a system where there are very few bad people, but if you find yourself in a bad system, you will be part of bad outcomes. If you're standing at the end of a sausage factory, right, at the end of the conveyor belt in the sausage factory, don't be shocked when it gives you sausage. That's all I'm saying. Right? Sometimes I think people are sort of stunned right, when the sausage factory gives them sausage, like they forgot to read the sign that it was a sausage factory, it's sort of what it does. We keep expecting it to give us chicken, and it's not going to give us chicken, it's not programmed for that. So when we have inequality, we have to understand there's a certain degree to which these systems have been in place for a very long time. They end up having their own internal logic, the school systems do, law enforcement does, the labor market does, and unless we challenge some of that logic, we find ourselves back at square one. So that's the first thing, the humility to recognize it isn't about us, so much as it is the systems within which we find ourselves. The second thing is a willingness to acknowledge our own blind spots. You cannot be an effective ally or co-collaborator with the marginalized in whatever category if you don't acknowledge by definition that they know more about their marginality than you will ever know. Right? Which is to say that we have to be challenging on a racial level, those of us who are white, challenging others who are white to acknowledge that people of color are fundamentally the experts on their own experience. Which is why when I come in to speak, I'm not here to speak about the black and brown experience because that is not my place nor my area of expertise. I know my people, I'm talking about whiteness. And I'm talking about how whiteness clouds our understanding of this and actually encourages a certain degree of obliviousness and ignorance, just like 
being male in a male-dominated society clouds our judgment about the way that women experience misogyny and rape culture, just like being straight does the same with straight supremacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When you are a member of the dominant group in whatever category, you have the luxury of being oblivious to the reality that other people live. And it doesn't matter if you're a good person. You still have the luxury of being oblivious. In my country, we see this all through history. We can go back and look at some of the polling data that was taken in the early 60s before the civil rights movement had succeeded in obtaining some of the laws that were passed in the 1960s. So the Civil Rights Act in my country was passed in 64, Voting Rights Act was 65, Fair Housing Act was 68, but in 1962 and 63, when one of the big polling companies went out and asked a large representative sample of white people, do you think blacks are treated equally in your community? This is 1963 also, sort of an easy question with an incredibly obvious answer in retrospect, right? It's the high watermark of the civil rights movement. It's the year of the March on Washington, right? So everybody ought to be able to answer this no, because normally 200,000 people don't go to Washington, D.C. in late August in the heat to just have fun. They're going because they're angry about something. There's something wrong. So when you ask white people, do you think blacks are treated equally, it should be an instantaneous answer in 1963. And now, if I were to ask white folks in my country, do you think blacks were being treated equally in 1963, they'd all pass the test. Because it doesn't take any courage a half century or more later to admit how rotten things were. But in 1963, when the Gallup organization asked that question, two out of three white folks said, yeah, I think everything's pretty good. 1962, they asked white folks, do you think black children have the same chance to get a good education as white children? Now, come on, y'all. It's 1962. Again, not a hard question. But in 1962, 87 out of 100 white people were like, yeah, I think that's about right. I think black kids have just as good a chance to get good schooling. Now, in retrospect, I can look at that, and I can sort of mock it. And we can look at it as borderline delusional. But what does it say? Were those bad people? Well. There's bad people in every group, good people in every group, you know. So sure, some of it could be that. But see, I think the, the, the scarier answer is the reason that so many white folks didn't know, even when it was obvious, because it was obvious, right? It was on TV every night. Every night you were getting footage of brutality meted out against black folk in places like Birmingham. There were only three stations, for God's sake. There was no cable. There was ABC, NBC, and CBS in my country. They all went off at midnight. Everybody was watching the same three stations, and yet white folks couldn't understand what they were seeing, not because they were bad people, but because they had the luxury of just tuning it out and remaining oblivious. And so even though it was coming into our living rooms every evening, and it was on our front pages every morning, and even though it's obvious in retrospect, white folks had the luxury of not knowing the truth, because you know why? It wasn't going to be on the test, was it? And by that, I mean whatever test we had to take to graduate from school and be deemed competent, whatever test we had to take to get into the next level of school, whatever test we had to take to get a professional certification for whatever job you might want, you didn't have to actually show that you understood black and brown reality. And that hasn't changed. It hasn't changed in my country, and it hasn't changed in your country. You can still be stone cold ignorant to the reality of First Nations peoples all across this continent and still be deemed competent to be a doctor, to be a social worker, to be a therapist, to have any particular job that you want. You don't have to know that. That's not on the test. You can remain oblivious. Now, on the other hand, black and brown folk, peoples of color all throughout my country and yours, they don't have that luxury, do they? They don't get to be ignorant to our stuff, those of us who are white. People of color better know our stuff. They better know the stuff that we think is important because that is going to be on the test. Actually, that's going to be the whole test and nothing but the test, right? Is going to be our stuff. And people of color are going to have to know it because that is the stuff you have to know to be deemed competent. That's privilege when you don't have to know other people's truth. That's a luxury. And when you have to know other people's truth, that is a burden, especially when it isn't shared equally. You see, the privilege of obliviousness is a huge one. It gives me one less thing I got to worry about today, right? One less thing I got to know. And there's no shame in being oblivious, please. When I say we have to be responsible for being oblivious, it's not about shame and it's not about blame. People are oblivious to stuff, not their own fault. I'm oblivious to a lot. I'm oblivious to calculus, y'all. You know why? Because I never took it. You know why? Because they didn't make me. And if they weren't going to make me, I sure as hell was not going to volunteer for the abuse. Are you kidding? 
I knew I wasn't going to be an engineer, so I'm going to let somebody else do calculus. I'm glad if y'all like calculus, thank God, somebody's got to do that. It just wasn't going to be me. And so I knew that, and so I avoided taking it because they didn't require it of me. As a result, I don't know how to do it. If I were to stand up on this stage and try to do calculus for you tonight, anyone in this room who'd ever taken it would instantly know that I did not know what I was talking about. And you would probably turn to your neighbor because you're paying close attention, and you would say, didn't he just tell us that he never even took that class? Aha, exactly my point when it comes to identity. Because you see, in my country and yours, a lot of white folks act like we know when racism is affecting people of color better than people of color know it, and we never took the class. Do you understand what I'm saying? And a lot of men act as though we know when sexism is operating, or if rape culture is even a thing, better than women know, and we never had to take the class. And those of us who were straight and cisgendered, or those of us who have money, or those of us who were able-bodied, or those of us who are members of whatever dominant group act like we understand the systems of oppression that affect others who were not in those groups better than the people who were affected by it, and we never had to take the class. That's the problem. Unless we own our obliviousness is we end up ignoring that the real source of wisdom are those who are most affected, and we need to learn to listen to them. The third thing we have to do is we have to acknowledge our own biases. Because if we're trying to get other people to address these issues in themselves and in the society, it's very hard to do if a person thinks you're judging them, right? So if someone thinks, if I come to another white person, for instance, or as a man, if I go to another guy, and I come across as if I'm saying to that person, I'm smarter than you, I understand this more than you, you're a horrible, evil person, and stupid as well, which sometimes is tempting. It is tempting sometimes to do this because people say and do stupid things and they say and do horrible, evil, nasty things as well. But if you come across that way trying to build allies and build co-collaborators and build movements of resistance, it's probably not going to work because people don't want to join a struggle that makes them feel dumb, makes them feel stupid, makes them feel ignorant, makes them feel evil, right? Um, and so we have to acknowledge our own biases if I want someone else to acknowledge theirs. Just like I need to acknowledge my own privilege if I want someone else to acknowledge their privilege. It's very hard for anybody to want to go first. So if I'm trying to bring people into a movement, you've got to put that out there. And so when it comes to our biases, nobody ever wants to acknowledge they have them. No one ever volunteers to say, well, not, I mean, not no one. Nazis do. They're very proud of their biases, overt white supremacists. But the vast majority of white people don't rush to the you know, front of the line to say, yes, I'm the racist. It's totally me. I'm the one. Right? Rather, we deny it to our last breath. Oh, I don't have a racist bone in my body. I don't know why we decided that bones were the racist things. <laughs> um, but we say that, or we say, I can't be racist, you know, because I have black friends, which um, I should just point out, like, uh, black folks have heard this for a very long time. Um, and uh, let me just say, um, first of all, all white people say that, and we are usually lying. Um, <laughs> that's not to say that we don't sometimes have black friends, but I mean, hmm. There was a survey several years ago found that 75% of white Americans said that they had black friends. I don't know if you know the census data in my country, but let me just uh, share this with you. 75% of white people the year that that was done was 142 million white people who said they had not just one black friend, said they had many. 75% of us said we had many black friends. 142 million white people said they had many black friends. Think about what many means, because if I wanted to say I had one, I would just say a. If I wanted to say two, I would say a couple. If I wanted to say three, I would say what? A few. See, so we're already up to four or more. 142 million white people saying they have four or more black friends each, and there were only 35 million black people to go around. <laughs> Half of whom said they didn't have any white friends. So it was actually 17 and a half million black people to go around for 142 million white people times four. Clearly other people didn't take math either. It wasn't just me, right? And uh, so either, either white folks were exaggerating how friendly we are with black folks or black people are incredibly busy in my country running from white person house to white person house to white person house, showing up for the barbecue, showing up to be our friends. And then they gotta go, I'm heading out. I got another house I gotta hit. I gotta go to Ted's down the road. Meet up with him, cause I'm his buddy. You know, I gotta make an appearance. Um, 
Which is all to say, right, that we use these excuses. Of course, the idea that even if you do have black friends, that somehow that gets you out of being a racist, maybe? Like, how, how does that work? Because if that works, like every heterosexual man could just be like, I can't be sexist. I date women. I have a wife. <laughs> right? I mean, I don't know too many women who buy that argument, but that would basically be the analogy, right? Well, I, I have a wife. How can I possibly be sexist? The only sexist men are the gay ones because they don't have. I mean, that would be like the most idiotic <laughs> argument, right? But that would be the analogy. So we make these absurd just to get out of the obvious, which is that we all have these biases. Why do we know we have them? Well, A, because research says so, but B, because common sense says so. We've all been exposed year after year after year, all of our lives, to stereotypes and imagery and symbolism around race and ethnicity and identity, as well as religion and class and gender and sexuality. Right? So much so that when I do workshops, sometimes I'll ask people, take out a piece of paper, Take out a pen, and I'm just going to give you, you know, two minutes. I want you to write down every stereotype that you can think of about whatever group. And sometimes I'll change it up. Sometimes I'll say black folks. Sometimes I'll say Asian folks. Sometimes I'll say Jews. Sometimes I'll say, well, whatever. You know, I can, any, any group, doesn't matter who it is. Um, and I have yet to ever have anybody, when I ask them to write these down, I'm not asking them what they think, remember. I'm just asking, do you know of any stereotypes about these? I've never had anybody raise their hand and go, I got nothing. Can I Google it? Because I, I can't think of anything, right? They all can. In fact, it's like they're racing in that two minutes to see who can get the most of them on the page, right? We all know what they are. And the research says that if you know what the racial stereotypes are, it doesn't take a lot to trip them in your mind, right? Because they're just right there waiting to be tripped. And the way that our, our minds work, right, is if a person who is stigmatized with a certain stereotype as a member of a certain group does anything that triggers a remembrance of that stereotype, which it's really easy to do, right? That's the thing that gets stuck in our mind. And that's the thing that we remember, whether we're evaluating them for a job or we're a teacher in a classroom evaluating a student or if we're an officer, a law enforcement officer, and we're interacting with people in the community or we're a banker and we have somebody applying for a home loan uh, at our desk, right? It doesn't take much because those stereotypes are things about intelligence and about honesty and aggression and all of those things. And it doesn't take a lot to do something that might trigger that, whereas somebody who isn't a member of a group that has that stereotype can do the same stuff. And it doesn't have the same effect because there's no mental schema that connects these ideas together, right? Um, so we have to admit that advertising works on us. Right? To admit our own biases is not to say that we're bad people, it's to say that we're just people who are programmed by the society in which we live. That's why advertisers spend all that money on advertisements, right? because they know that if you see ads enough for their product, you'll buy their product. Right? Even if it's something you never, I mean, I, I joke about this, but it's true. I, you know, I, I don't know how this happened, but apparently some several years ago, the executives at Taco Bell decided, you know what we need? is a breakfast burrito crunch wrap. The hell is that? Like, whoever wanted that? It's like a burrito with some sausage and egg and some hot sauce on it. And it's like, nobody was begging for that. Nobody was calling Taco Bell and saying, you know, what we need is this horrible sounding greasy thing at 6 o'clock in the morning. But what they did is they created it. Somebody at Taco Bell said, watch this. Yeah. Pretty soon they make this greasy breakfast crunch wrap and people are lined up around the building. They're like, oh, huh? not going to McDonald's in the morning anymore. Screw that. I don't want the Egg McMuffin. Give me the burrito crunch wrap, right? Because somebody did an advertisement and encouraged it, right? And the research on marketing says that if you see an ad for a product about a dozen times, it's called the rule of 12. Um, if you see an ad for a product a dozen times, that's the point at which you're more likely to purchase it, exponentially more likely to purchase it, right? Sort of the tipping point. Um, well, if I can make you buy a certain tennis shoe after 12 ads, or I can make you buy a certain tablet, or I can make you buy a certain cell phone, or I can make you buy a certain kind of toothpaste or toilet paper, or whatever it is, after 12 advertisements, how much easier do you think it might be to get you to buy into a racial stereotype, or a gender stereotype, or a sexual, or a religious, or an economic stereotype? Because you've seen that ad way more than 12 times, if you know what I mean, metaphorically speaking. You've been exposed to those things hundreds of times. And so we have to be honest enough to acknowledge that it has affected us. Many years ago, I began to understand this when I was going to a conference in 2003 in Iowa. And um, 
I was getting on a plane to go to the conference to fly to Des Moines, had to fly to St. Louis first. And as I go down the jet bridge, I have a habit of, uh, of always looking into the cockpit to make sure there are pilots. Um, because just like I didn't study calculus, I also don't understand the physics of flight, right? Because I didn't take that class either. I don't know how flying works. I don't think it does, actually. I think it might be an illusion. But um, in any event, I want to make sure somebody's flying the plane. So I look into the cockpit every time. And uh, I did this time. And for the first time in all the years that I've been flying, which at that point um, professionally had been about eight years, but I'd been flying even before that every now and then, um, I noticed something that I'd never seen before in all the years that I had been in the air. And that was not one but two black men at the controls of the plane. It's very rare, by the way, to see that because in the commercial fleet within the United States, um, there are only about 3% of the pilots are African-American. So to have even one black pilot is pretty rare. To have two uh, is extraordinary. Or the airline is setting those guys up. I don't know. It's one or the other. Like, you just don't really know, you know, exactly what it is. And I'd never seen this before. And as I go in, I want you to ask yourself, what do you think my initial emotional internal reaction was to see in these two men? I'm going to make it multiple choice because, you know, that's what we do. We have multiple choice tests. I'm going to make it multiple choice tests. Do you think my reaction internally was, Free at last. <laughs> free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Let me call all my friends and my family on the cell phone and tell them that we have reached the moment of aviation equality. That is choice number one. Don't let the cynicism in my voice throw you. It could be that one, but it's not. Two, oh dear God, can these men fly this plane? Now look, I'm a professional anti-racist, y'all. This is not some amateur shit. Like, I do this every day, and I still had that thought come into my head. Now, granted, I was able to stop the thought. I was able to stifle it. I was able to defeat it. Good for me. I'm doing my work, right? I'm supposed to be doing my work, and I caught it, and I realized how stupid it was, and I realized how racist it was. Not the point, right? The point is not that I caught it and didn't go screaming and running from the plane and didn't say anything about how horrible it was that these two black men were going to fly the plane. The point is, I had the thought in the first place. In spite of knowing at every level, intellectually, philosophically, morally, ethically, spiritually, at every level, why this was a horrible, unacceptable thought, but it still came into my head. If that can happen to me, that can happen to anyone, and we have to be on guard against it. It doesn't mean that it would happen every day. Right? Some days I might not have had that reaction. It could be anything from not having enough sleep to having an upset stomach to just having a bad day, just got in a fight with a, a spouse or partner or whatever. Anything could set that kind of. But my point is we're all susceptible because we've all been taught what authority is supposed to look like and what expertise is supposed to look like and what the boss is supposed to look like and what the pilot is supposed to look like and what the doctor is supposed to look like and what the loan officer is supposed to look like and what the cop is supposed to look like, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so long as we've been conditioned to have those images, that stuff is never fully out of us. So we can make a choice to engage in an anti-racist way and to become co-conspirators in the struggle against that, but we'll never be able to do it if we don't own our own piece of it or if we, again, try to get distance between ourselves and the people who we would like to bring in to this work. We have to acknowledge not only our obliviousness, but our bias. And finally, we have to be able to see our own interest in obtaining equity. See, I think one of the biggest problems for allies is that we perceive sometimes that the work we're being asked to do is ultimately, however moral it might be and however ethical it might be, that it's fundamentally asking us to lose something, right? To give up something in a way that is an objective loss that will make our lives worse off. And it's very hard if you think that's what this is, right? To get anyone to just say, yes, I will voluntarily make my life worse for someone else. Most people just won't do that. It has nothing to do with race. It has nothing to do with identity. It's just most people are not that altruistic to actually do something if they believe it's going to hurt them, even if they know deep down it's going to make things better for someone else. We just don't rush to do that, most of us, right? Which is why if we're really going to build movements for change, we have to be very clear that this thing we're talking about, creating racial equity and ending discrimination, this is not a charity move. 
This is not about what we do for other people so as to make their lives better and whatever happens to us, oh well. This is about self-help. This is about building a functional community. This is about creating a society that works for everyone because these inequities do not indeed work even for the dominant group at the end of the day. Oh, it works real good for a while. But in the long run, that system of inequality is dysfunctional, and it's dysfunctional even for the people who benefit from it. What do I mean by that? Well, go back to what I said earlier about hiring. If we are hiring people based on networks and who you know and connections, or if we're hiring people even based on so-called qualifications, but let's be honest, qualifications are about access and opportunity. What's on my resume is indicative of what experience I've had, and that's indicative of what opportunity I've had. So even if I think I'm making hiring decisions on the basis of qualifications, if I'm just looking at a resume and I'm not looking at everything that went into that resume, if I'm not looking into the context within which person A accumulated credentials and person B didn't, then I might make the decision to hire person A thinking they're more qualified, but they might not be, right? But because I, you know, they had a five-lap head start and an eight-lap race, they hit the tape first, and I decided they were the faster runner. That's not really how it works. If I have a five-lap head start and an eight-lap race because I am of an identity group that's had more access, I ought to hit the tape first, metaphorically speaking. My resume ought to be better. My test score ought to be better. doesn't mean that I'm actually better. That runner who has the five-lap head start, if the end of race, they're only four laps ahead, by definition, the one that gained ground and closed that gap was a faster runner. And the same is true in the job market, right? If certain people start out behind and they close the gap, they are by definition harder working. They are by definition more meritorious. They are by definition more deserving of opportunity, even if on paper they don't look as quote unquote good. So if I hire based on all of these supposedly objective formula that we use, and all of these supposedly objective criteria, I might be overlooking the best people for my institution, my government agency, my company, and that actually works to my detriment. It hurts them directly. That's an injustice against the people I'm overlooking. It's also not real smart for me, and it doesn't help me either. It ultimately sets my institution, my company, my department, my NGO, whatever it is, up for failure because I'm overlooking all of this talent, and I'm doing it in the name of merit, but I'm not really finding the best people. So this isn't charity work. This is about equity as an imperative for excellence, not just as an imperative for fairness and justice. The second thing, right, is that when you look at a society, and this is something we're certainly grappling with now in the United States, if you have a society that says all along the course of your life, as mine does, and frankly, as your does too, though we, we perhaps perfected this ideology, but it is one very much alive in Canada as well. This notion that wherever you end up, you know, it's all about your own effort. Anybody can make it if they just try hard, right? That's a very operative ideology here as it is in the United States. In the United States, it's sort of our secular gospel. It's Genesis 1-1 of the Bible of America is the idea that if you just work hard, you can make it. If you didn't make it, it's your own fault. You should have worked harder. You didn't have the right work ethic. You didn't have the right talent. You just didn't have what it took to make it. Well, here's the problem with that. First of all, we know it's not accurate. We all know people who've worked very hard their whole lives have nothing to show for it. And we know other people that were, to use a baseball metaphor, which may or may not mean much to you, but it certainly means a lot in the United States, uh, people who were born on third base and think they hit a triple and have never actually had to even step up to the plate because they were born there, right? Um, we all know that the system isn't really a system of meritocracy. We preach that. We talk about rugged individualism. I beg to remind you there is no such thing as a rugged individual. In fact, I would go so far as to say that there is no such thing as an individual abstracted from their social context. Human beings are social creatures. We do not live in isolation. None of us were raised on an island by a porpoise, right? And as a result, we've all had help. Some of that help has been connected to race. Some has been connected to class. Some has just been about luck and the people who came into our lives. But there is no such thing as an individual abstracted from that context. And yet our ideology of meritocracy that infects the West, my country and yours in particular, says wherever you end up is all about you. Here's the problem with that. If we preach that wherever you end up is all about you, two things happen. Actually, three things happen. The first thing that happens is the people who are doing well internalize a sense of their own superiority because the ideology says, well, if you're doing well, it's because you're the best. 
So now I get a sense of my own superiority as a white person looking down at people of color not doing as well, as a rich person looking down at poor people and working class people not doing as well, as a man in a hierarchy that's male dominated looking down at women who are not doing as well, right? It allows me to internalize that. The second thing is it allows me to internalize the notion of someone else's inferiority and it possibly causes them to internalize a sense of their own inferiority, looking around and wondering why they're not doing as well after all. If it's all about my own effort, why am I struggling? So people of color can internalize blame and self-doubt, right? Internalize oppression. Poor people of all colors can do the same, right? Women can do the same with regard to issues of gender inequity, but it does a third thing. And the third thing that it does is it sets people up, even the ones who normally win. It sets us up. And if you don't believe that, all you got to do is look at what's happening in my country right now with all of these white folks in these dying, small, rural communities who are killing themselves with opiates and heavy drinking and increased rates of suicide in the last 10 to 15 years. We've had this huge spike. You've heard about these opioid deaths and the opioid crisis, right, that is racking and ravaging the United States and is also affecting most of the Western industrialized world in some capacity, but certainly in the U.S., off the charts. What do you think that's about? Why is it these people are increasingly offing themselves, either directly by committing suicide or over the long term with opiates and heavy drinking? Because that's the only group that's actually seeing this huge spiral. It's starting to now catch up in black and brown communities, but for 13 years, it's been overwhelmingly white and working class and middle age and non-college educated. Why? Well, to listen to the media tell it, they would tell you it's, they call these the deaths of despair. These people are struggling. And they're struggling so badly that they'd rather just check out. Well, I get that, but here's the problem. They are struggling. Millions of white folks are certainly struggling in the U.S. and millions of white folks struggling in Canada and millions of white folks all around the world struggling. But what's interesting is in every country where white folks are struggling, the people of color in those countries are much more likely to be unemployed than the white folks are much more likely to be poor than the white folks are, much more likely to be unhealthy in other areas than the white folks are, much more likely to have a lower life expectancy in general than the white folks. So on every indicator of social well-being, those white folks are not the ones in the most despair, but they're the ones who apparently are not coping very well with the despair that they're suffering. Ask yourself why. There's only one answer. If I'm told my whole life that wherever I end up is all about me, and as a white person, I have the luxury of actually believing that nonsense. When I end up down here, I don't know where to put the pain. See, black folks already knew the system was a scam. People of color already knew the system was rigged. So people of color are not shocked when the economy takes a nosedive and they find themselves out of work, right? When the Great Recession hit, black folks and brown folks were the most affected by it, but they were the ones who just sort of kept on moving, you know, because it was just a more extreme version of Tuesday, right? <laughs> But for a lot of white folks, we were like, oh my God, double digit unemployment, what are we gonna do, right? Peoples of color have been dealing with that consistently year in and year out, but the group that had the privilege of being oblivious to other people's reality and oblivious to the way the system actually operated, able to put those blinders over our eyes, able to have that veil of ignorance, and then when that gets stripped away from us, we're the ones who don't have the coping skills. See, I guess what I'm saying is that systems of privilege, they taste really good 364 days out of the year, but if day 365 is a day you get laid off because the company moves to a different country to downsize or to save money in some way that they uh, feel they have to outsource the jobs, or if day 365 is the day that you know, your personal relationship falls apart or things don't work out at school. If you've been told all your life that where you end up is all about you and you've actually had the luxury of believing it, you do not know how to cope with that, which means equity would have been a far better bet for you too, right? Because if we hadn't lied to you, if we hadn't allowed you to remain oblivious, if we had insisted that you understand the way the system actually works, you would have engaged in solidarity with those who were the targets of that system from the beginning but we are allowed to wallow in our ignorance and that's not healthy for anyone. So we have a stake in changing this system. It's not gonna be functional in the next 20 and 30 years as this continent becomes increasingly of color, right? And white folks need an economy that functions for everyone, not just for us, because if it doesn't function for black and brown folk, it's not gonna function for us either. This is really a survival issue that we're talking about. And so if we can do this, if we can have the humility to acknowledge the things that we don't know and to listen to those who do know, if we can acknowledge our own biases, our own privileges, and 
if we're able to see our own interest in creating equity. We can create a movement that is much broader and more capacious than the one we have now, in which we can be allies, whether it's white folks, in allyship and solidarity with people of color, men, with women, straight and cisgendered folk, with LGBTQ folk, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we do that, then it isn't going to be about guilt and it's not going to be about shame and blame. We will take responsibility for building the society that we've always been told we already had, but that we never actually had obtained yet. And I think that if we're committed to it, we can build that world, but we have to get busy very quickly. We have to do more than eradicate discrimination on one day, and we have to understand that discrimination has this larger systemic and institutional practice that all of us are implicated in, not just the bad people over there, but every single one of us in every single day. Thank you all so much for coming out. I appreciate you. And um, and and uh, and I'd be glad to take any questions that you have at this time. So we'll do that for the next I don't know 20 minutes or so, if you've got some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a university in Ontario right now. They uh, have this uh, speaker series, unpopular. Speaker yeah. Series. So they're bringing in a white supremacist. They're known white supremacists from the U.S. Yeah. And uh, he comes to talk to us about, well, not us, but them, uh, yeah. about um, white European ethnocide. So mm -hmm. we know that the whole purpose of this speech is to hate, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the law is obviously in your country a little different than in mine, but the, but the principles are, are in many ways similar that are at stake, and the decisions that we have to make are very similar. My, my position on this is, first of all, I'm a big fan of free speech because I certainly use mine, so I'm a fan of it. Um, but I also realize that free speech does not mean consequence free speech, right? And it never has. What really all free speech means uh, in a legal sense is that I can't lock you up for the things that you say. I cannot criminally sanction you for what you say. It doesn't mean, however, that I'm obligated to give you a microphone to help facilitate your saying of it. Because if it meant that, then we would all be entitled to a radio show. And we're not. Um, everybody would be entitled to their own printing press. And we're not. Uh, you don't have to facilitate my speaking here tonight. I'm glad someone did. But you didn't have to. And I've had schools that didn't want to bring me. Uh, which, you know what? That's their right. If they don't want to, you know, Brigham Young University, in, uh, and it's a Mormon school in, in, in Salt Lake, uh, they've never brought me. I don't consider them to be oppressing me. That they're making a decision based on their values, right, that the things that I say are not in line with their values. So be it. By the same token, I think a school ought to be able to say, uh, sort of white nationalism is not uh, consonant with our values, so we'd really prefer if you didn't come. And the idea that they can't do that, or they feel that they can't do that, uh, because of the notion of free speech is to confuse free speech with consequence free speech and to suggest that we don't have a right, even in an academic institution, to draw lines. And that's what's fascinating to me, right? Because putting aside whether or not we ought to keep people from speaking, which is a practical matter as well as a legal, there, there are legal issues and philosophical, there's also practical issues. And, I, and one can make an argument, and I'm not even going to get into this because it's like a whole nother lecture, as to whether or not no platforming is the best strategy. But, but here's the thing. The idea that it's inherently wrong to no platform, even in an academic setting, seems absurd. Think about it. An academic, so a college and a university, they have standards for hiring people, right? You can't just say whatever the hell comes to your mind and then expect to get a job in an academic department. So if the geology department isn't compelled to hire someone who's a young earth creationist who thinks the world was created 6,000 years ago, right, and that humans rode around on the backs of dinosaurs, the geology department is not obligated to hire that nonsense. The geology department is not obligated to hire someone who thinks the earth is flat, right, even though there are people like that, because why? They get to draw lines about standards. There's scholarship, and you are on the other side of that. Um, by the same token, you know, they don't have to, environmental science department uh, doesn't have to hire a climate uh, 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 change denier. Um, people don't have to hire Holocaust deniers. People don't have, you know, they don't, they can actually say, like, these are the standards of scholarship and you violate them. Now, if a department can do that, 
If every department at a college has the right to do that, how is it that the college as a whole doesn't have the right to do that when it comes to who is going to be given a platform to speak? That just seems weird to me. Like, yeah, we got these standards, but not for this free-for-all give a speech thing. Anybody can come and talk. I mean, it just is like, that doesn't make sense, right? It seems highly inconsistent. So even though I think we can have an interesting debate about what the best strategies are, and I think we have to apply different strategies to different speakers, because some people, like the one who's coming to that particular college, she is an overt uh, white nationalist, and there's absolutely no doubt that that's who she is um, and who she's connected to. She is connected directly to some of the terrorists who were responsible for the murder of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville back in August. So I think there's a really good case to be made that in that regard, she is a supporter of terrorism, legit terrorism, uh, that we, of course, don't define that way uh, most of the time because you know we only do that for folks who are Muslim. Uh, and we only do that for folks who are brown. But, but, but truthfully, that's what she is. That is different from a lot of other people. I don't necessarily think that we ought to treat that, let's say, the same way that we would other people who I find very offensive in a lot of things that they say, but they are in a different category. Like there actually is a difference between her and someone like Ben Shapiro, who I can't stand either, but he's not a white nationalist, right? He's not a Nazi. He's offensive and ridiculous, but we can show up and demonstrate just how ridiculous Ben Shapiro is in ways that I think are probably better strategically than what we would do for David Duke or what we would do for, uh, you know, Matt Heimbach, who is another white nationalist. Well, I don't know if you heard the story. Matt Heimbach uh, <laughs> just had a little... Thing happened. He's the head of one of the big neo-Nazi organizations. He apparently was having an affair with his father-in-law's wife, and they caught him, and it's very, yeah. Um, so they got in a fight, and they got arrested, and uh, he was, he's married to the child of the other guy in the movement, and he was sleeping with his wife. And I, anyway, he won't be speaking anywhere anytime soon, I'm just saying. <laughs> but like, there are different gradations of horrible and I think some of them, uh, frankly, schools should be able to say, yeah, no, this is absolutely in violation of our fundamental principles. Uh, others, I think we might strategically respond in a different way, and we have to look at it very case by case. But I just, philosophically, I don't understand the idea that free speech means everyone gets a platform, because if that's true, then you do actually have to bring in the flat earth young earth creationists. You do actually have to bring in the Holocaust denier. You actually do have to bring in, you know, the person that thinks the moon is made of cheese or, or, or whatever. You know, the, well, it's, it's a different opinion. <laughs> you know, people believe it. Uh, somebody thinks it's real, you know. And so um, I think we do have the right, particularly considering that, you know, an academic calendar is only however many days it is, 188 days, 190 days a year. There are only so many days. There are only so many venues. There are only so many rooms and so many microphones. It just isn't really practical to have everybody have the mic, even if it were desirable, and it's not. Um, so I think Nazis have the right to speak, but I think they got to find their own mics, and they got to find their own podiums, and they got to find their own audiences. And when they do show up, uh, I think you know th they might have the right to speak, but but they don't have the right to our ears. They don't have yeah they don't have the right to our ears. They don't have the right to to you know the fact that I have a right to speak doesn't mean that if you you know if you wanted to give me shit tonight and, and shout me down, that's your free speech. It may or may not be strategically very kind or nice of you. It might not be the smartest move, but that's your free speech. The idea that you don't have a right to like talk back to the stuff, I say, of course you do. I'm glad you didn't, thank you. But, you know, but, like, but when Nazis speak, I think we have the absolute right to call them uh, out for the things that they say. And one of the things that we see, Richard Spencer has just you know, recently decided to suspend his college tour because he's admitted that the anti-fascist folks are winning because they show up and they outnumber their people and they, and they shout them down. And he said, it's just not any fun anymore. Good, good. Nazism shouldn't be fun. That's sort of good. That's, that's sort of what we're going for here. So I believe in free speech. I believe it has to be protected, but I think um, there have to also be consequences for the things that you say. Uh, short of legal consequences, and if that means that you get shouted at, that's what it means, you know? Other questions? Yes?
Right. Well, I think the only way that changes, you know, you have to sort of, um, to some extent, take away the option of the status quo being maintained. And the way you do that is you have to create new policies, practices, and procedures that force institutions and agencies and companies, employers, et cetera, um, to go about a different process. You have to create those policies, though, because they won't happen just because people are well-intended and well-meaning. They only happen when they are really sort of required and when the issue is forced, whether that um, is by targeting jobs specifically to what we, what we like to call underrepresented groups because we like passive language, but I prefer that we call them marginalized groups because it's an active thing. People are not passively underrepresented, they are actively marginalized. Um, so whether it's that, which I think is, is something we have to really think of doing, because honestly, otherwise, people who, who would have had many of those jobs anyway, if the system had been fair, you know, those folks who were marginalized would have had more of those jobs if the system had been fair. So we need to try to restore folks to the place they would have been had the system been fair. We can't ever get it perfect, but we can certainly do better than we do now, but only if we make it a requirement. The second thing, I talked about this today with the employer, with the folks when I was talking about employment. Um, you know, one of the ways that, that, it, that there was a, a policy in the state of Washington many years ago, and it was abandoned um, because they had a, a, a voter initiative in Washington state that outlawed the larger practice of so-called racial preferences or affirmative action, and the state got nervous that they were going to get sued if they continued this policy, so they got rid of it. But I think it's a really good policy, and it was called plus three. And the idea behind plus three was that let's say you had a civil service exam for a government position of some sort. So let's say, you know, government agency, Department of Education in Washington or the Department of Transportation or whatever was hiring. Um, and let's say that uh, each of those people, they have to take a test. Everybody takes the same test. It's one of the things they get evaluated on. Um, and what Washington would do is they would say, okay, let's say we, we, we don't have a really good history of representation for, let's say, um, indigenous folks in this department. We just have a really bad record with, with First Nations peoples and, and native peoples, and so we're gonna really try and do better by indigenous folks on this hiring round that we're doing. So let's say you get 100 people apply for the job, and um, normally the rule would be you interview the top 10 people in terms of their tests, how, how they did on the test, and one of those people is who you'll hire. Well, they had a program called Plus Three, and the idea behind Plus Three was you're wanting to make sure that in that final pool of interviews, you have at least three, at least three, of the target group in that pool. So let's say that out of the top 10 test takers, none of them happen to be First Nations. Let's say that the highest scoring First Nations applicant was like number 12, and maybe the next one was 26, and maybe the next one was 47. Well, plus three would say, in addition to the 10 people you already got who didn't meet your need, we're going to add these three into the mix, make sure they get a chance to interview. Doesn't mean they're going to get hired, but we're going to make sure that they're in the mix because otherwise we might be overlooking this group. We have a history of doing that. We're trying not to do that. Um, if they had one First Nations person in the top 10, you would add two more for three total. If you had two in the top 10, you would add one more. The idea being we just want to create a, a process whereby marginalized groups have got the maximum opportunity to get in and prove themselves in that setting. Now, it's not perfect because there are certain biases that can operate in the interview process, including some of those subconscious biases that the research says are so prevalent that we don't even often recognize we're acting on. So it's not a perfect policy, but it was a way to at least increase the likelihood of marginalized folks getting jobs, and it worked. In many cases, you would find that the person who got the job was one of those plus three candidates, and they might have been 37th on the list in terms of the test, but once they got in the interview room, they actually did better and were more qualified and more competent and impressed the interviewer more than the person that ranked number one or number two or number three or whatever. Um, and in addition to that, of course, if you're, if you're properly training the people who do these evaluations to understand and to check their own subconscious biases, you can improve that process as well. But the bottom line to this, you know, the answer, long, short answer to the question is you have to create policies and practices and procedures that, that make it harder for people to just keep doing what they're doing. Um, and that means, you know, using different evaluation schema, using different processes, having multiple levels of, of evaluation, having an evaluation that includes the broadest number of people possible where um, one person's bias can potentially be checked by another person's openness. You know, if you only have one or two people doing an eval for a hire, 
if that one or two people happen to have those biases, that can torpedo someone's chances of getting a job. If you had a group of seven or eight people looking at it, you know, somebody on that committee or on that group might be able to intervene and say, wait a minute, I saw something in this person, maybe you didn't see, da 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 da, da you know. But you just have to, you have to be very deliberate about it. And I think the problem is a lot of times we're not deliberate. We just sort of sit back and, and assume that our good intentions will be enough to sort of carry us to a fair outcome, and it usually isn't, right? Other questions? Yes. Um, thank you very you bet. much, because it's always uh, nice to have someone else from the current elective hiring board, because on issues of racism and anti-racism and whatever, it's usually us that are out yeah. there having to do it, so this is great. Um, in my experience over time, I've noticed actually a strange thing happening. Right. Because at least they're here. Right, so right. So there's this weird right. thing happening yeah, yeah. around allies. So that's one. And I'm going to slip in another one, which is the area I work in. Um, I do a lot of um, social justice work. It's on the area of reparations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's interesting because I don't see those allies who are so interested in what happens mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. uh, people of color and black people jumping on that mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. really critical area for us because of all these things yeah. that happen now. We're asking for mm -hmm. reparations. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? So the two things you mentioned, both very important. Um, the first piece about the sort of protectionism of, of allies. A couple, couple things. One, actually there always were white allies in the struggle, but we didn't learn a lot about them. Um, which I think was a real problem because a lot of white folks who never knew that there were white folks in the struggles of the past um, don't really necessarily understand some of that history. And if you don't understand that history, you don't realize the mistakes that they made, as well as the things they did correctly, because there's always been mistakes and there's been good stuff. And if you understood the mistakes, you'd be less likely to keep making them. Um, and so what ends up happening is every generation, we keep rediscovering allies rather than having an understanding that there have always been people who were not the marginalized group who were in solidarity with those who were. And we need to be able to study that and learn from them, both the good, the bad, and the very, very ugly. Because what happens when we don't is we end up giving, as you said, far too much credit to an ally, even when an ally makes a, a, a mistake. Now, if you're really an ally, and you're really engaged in solidarity, and you're really a collaborator or co-conspirator in the movement, um, part of that is, is getting feedback, including feedback you don't want to get. Um, and that's true, again, for every one of us. That's not just something white folks have to be able to hear from people of color. It's something men who want to be allies, regardless of your race, need to be prepared to hear from women. It's what straight folk and cisgendered folk need to be prepared to hear from LGBTQ folk. Any of us who are trying to be an ally, we should want people to give us critical feedback. Now, of course, it always feels worse if that critical feedback is going to our motives and character, right? Nobody likes to have their core character question. That hurts. I mean, everyone hates that. No one enjoys that. But in terms of tactics, in terms of methods, in terms of the things that we say and that we do, we ought to be asking for that because that's how one becomes better at doing solidarity work. And yet I think there is this tendency to sort of encircle the ally with all of this, oh, but it's okay, as opposed to saying, well, it's great that you're doing what you're doing, but you're supposed to be doing that. Uh, we should be fighting for justice, and especially if you benefit from an injustice, you ought to be fighting that system, and you ought to be open to that, and therefore you ought to be open to the criticism as well. And I believe that we can, we can move to that place, but I agree right now that there's a lot of protectionism, and I think that that's rooted in a misunderstanding of the history of allyship. If we understood that there's always been allies, we wouldn't cut that much slack because we would expect more of allies. It's precisely because we don't know about them that we act like, oh, this is a new phenomenon. It's like a unicorn that just walked out of the forest, when in fact, there been people like that for a long time and we ought to know about them both for good and for bad. The piece on reparations, I think it, there are probably a number of reasons why 
I would say most white folks who do anti-racism work don't wade into it. I've written about it before and I've openly advocated systemic reparation for you know 20 years, probably at least. Um, but I would suspect that one of the reasons that people don't, and it's not a good reason, I'm just gonna tell you what I think my people think, is because I know my people, you know, I know, I know, uh, I got all white people on speed dial, y'all, just all, uh, you know, I just, just so you know. Um, but this is what I think is going on. Um, one, well, just for white folks generally, I think there's this fear that when we talk about reparations, the image that people have, which is an absurd image because this isn't what is actually being advocated by those individuals and organizations that have fought for reparations for a very long time, going back to the period right after enslavement when that movement really began, um, I think white folks have this image that reparations means that every month we're gonna have to write out a check to black people, right? Like in other words, it's gonna be like water bill, utility bill, rent, black people. And that's not what reparations is. It is not about having a line item on your Excel spreadsheet for black people. That's not what anybody's talking about. Like black folks going to the mailbox, getting the check written by me. That's not what, that's not, no one is talking about that. The reparations movement has always been about systemic repair. It has been about the investment of money that was denied to people of color and that was used to enrich both of our nations at the expense of peoples of color, in this case, people of African descent, money that, that, that our respective nations did in fact spend on infrastructure for white folks and on, and, and, and on economic development for white folks. Um, just trying to do the same thing that was done for white folks for people of color. In my country, the things that we did you know, with the GI Bill and the FHA and the VA loans and all the things that happened after World War II, that was massive investment in white working class communities. Reparations is about saying when you deny that to people of color, you have a moral obligation to go and do for them what you did for everyone else. But I don't think white folks understand it that way. We think it's literally like, ah, oh, here's my black people bill again, holy hell. And so then we get, you know, but it's not that. It's about systemic repair. It's about the governments and maybe some of the private sector actors that were involved in the maintenance of oppression as well having to pony up for what was done. Um, and does that come out of tax dollars? Yes, of course. But it's not about individuals having to literally sign a check every month. Uh, the reason why white allies, I think, don't talk about it as often as they should at all oftentimes is... I think we have a deep cynicism, born of experience, which is understandable, a deep cynicism about that as an issue in terms of, of where we are right now in people's ability to hear it. And so if as, a, as a white ally, if I think that's a non-starter, right, which I think most white folks assume it is a non-starter, because, you know, the, the numbers on this are just not good. I mean, the polling on it is really bad, right? And, and that's unfortunate that that should even matter. But I think from a movement building perspective, you have a lot of folks who were like, we can't lead with that. We're not even at the point where folks, folks are upset about minor affirmative action, man. They're losing their mind. Like people are literally emailing me saying, I can't get a job because all the jobs are going to black people and Mexicans. Really? All the jobs are going to black people in Mexico? Where the hell are these jobs? Because people of color are twice as likely to be out of work as white people, but these folks are losing their mind over minor stuff. So then you start talking about reparations, and it's like, oh, my God, you know. So I think there's a, a, a willingness or an unwillingness on the part of white folks to wade into those waters because we're, we're afraid that that's going to just shut down the conversation altogether. That's not a good excuse, by the way. I'm just saying I think that's what's going on. Um, which is why I think when we talk about reparation, it's really important that we do it. It's also very important that we contextualize it as a systemic action. And so what I just said a second ago about thinking of it as an equivalent of what we did for white America with the Homestead Act after 1862, where you have about 240 million acres of virtually free land to white people to homestead west of the Mississippi. That was a form of racial preference. The FHA, the VA loans, GI Bill, similar land allotments were done in Canada. All of these things, right, that have been done in our respective countries, we're just saying for the people who didn't get in on that, whether that's First Nations peoples, whether that's black folks, I mean, they should, that, we should do the same for them that we did for others. Hell, the United States, we rebuilt our enemies after World War II, right, with the Marshall Plan, and we, we spent billions of dollars, the equivalent now of probably trillions of dollars, rebuilding countries that we helped bomb right? But we wouldn't put that same money into black and brown space. So if we start thinking of it that way, um, I think we can start to at least have, a, have a, a more detailed and honest conversation. And I think it's going to be more than a minute before we get to a place 
where folks are prepared to truly join that struggle for reparation, but we have to at least be willing to talk about it because even the conversation about reparation is an important conversation, even if in the end of the day, we don't get that anytime soon. Even just the dialogue alone forces an honesty, right? Forces a comeuppance with the history. So that if we, if we demand, so think about it, if you demand reparations, knowing that it's not gonna happen anytime soon, but, as, but then you get, get fallback positions, right? You get fallback positions of other policies short of that that you might be able to get. Because if I'm asking, for, if we think of reparations as a 10 on a one to 10 scale of what folks are wanting, and I know I'm not gonna get 10 right now, we're, we're not there, but, if I, but at least if I told you what 10 was and I'm fighting for 10, you might have to give me seven, right? But if I don't even go to 10, if I just go to seven, and that's, that's my 10, but it's really just a seven, then I'm gonna have to settle for a four. Well, I don't want to settle for a four. I really would like to get 10, but I'll deal with the seven right now. But you have to ask for the things that you really believe in, and then you get fallbacks. And, and, and so ultimately, I think it would behoove us to have that conversation. Um, but I think a lot of folks are afraid because they just know where white folks are in this. And that doesn't mean they can't be changed and moved, but we got a lot of work to do um, to get them there. Take one more real quick before I let you out. Yeah, right there. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Well, ultimately, that has to happen, because if it doesn't and people are only able to hear it from me or from people who look like me, um, then we're not going to get where we need to go. Because by definition, if I can't hear it from the source of the wisdom, then I'm never really going to internalize the commitment to change that system because I'm just not ready to do it. If I can't hear your truth, then I can't be part of the solution to fix a systemic injustice that, that, that a person experiences. Um, I think the way we get there is twofold. Number one is those of us who are white, part of our allyship responsibility, and it's something that I take very seriously in my writing and in the podcast that I do and all of this, is um, we have to be putting forward the voices of people of color in addition to our own voice and encouraging those people who listen to us to also listen to those voices. So like one of the reasons I started the podcast was I wanted to amplify the voices of other people, almost exclusively, disproportionately people of color who've been guests on the show, including people whose voices are not necessarily heard. So not famous people of color whose names would be automatically recognized, but a lot of grassroots activists and, and artists and people that are doing incredible work but maybe are not known um, in the larger community. Because to me, that's part of my accountability is, you know, it's fine for me to speak and write, and I want people to listen to what I have to say because I think it's valuable and I want them to read what I write, but I also want to make sure that I'm helping to point them in the direction of some of those folks that right now they're not listening to. Um, so that's one thing that, that white folks can do uh, who, are, who are trying to be allies is to amplify the voices, whether it's on social media, whether that's you know with friends and with family in the classroom, whatever it is. Um, and then the second thing, of course, is that people of color have to continue to do as, as they always have, irrespective of how white people are gonna hear it, have to serve as the truth detectors and the barometers uh, of, of what is real and what's really happening. Because one of the things that I will say that I've seen in the last five to 10 years, and especially in the last five or six, is I am seeing more and more, not nearly enough, but more and more, um, white folks who are beginning to, it, to ingest and digest black and brown truth for the first time. Uh, maybe we've reached a critical mass because of social media where people get hit with it enough to where eventually after 30 times or 200 times it starts to sink in. It used to be um, very rare to see that, but I have seen in the course of when I travel, yeah, they might start with me, right? I might be, or, or people like me, white anti-racist might be the sort of gateway drug for, for some people to come into this work, right? but they don't stick with me. It's not just me. It's not like, oh, can't wait for Tim Wise to have another book because then I can read another thing about racism. Like they, they might start with me, but then they're going and they're exploring and they're going to those speeches by people of color and they're reading the books and they're watching the videos and they're, and they're imbibing something deeper than that. Um, and, and, and I think that's something that has only begun to happen. Um, really, in, in, in the US, it's only really begun to happen since the movement for black lives took off uh, after Trayvon Martin's death. 
And I think because of the, the brilliance of the use of social media by, and, and grassroots activism, community activism on the part of those activists in the movement, um, folks have been forced to see and to hear some things that are very uncomfortable that they might not have wanted to hear and see, but that they're starting to for the first time. So hopefully that trend will continue. But I, I think that's how it happens. People of color have to continue to do it, do the work regardless of whether white folks hear it or not. Uh, and white folks have to continue to point our own people in the direction of those folks of color and say, listen, now that you've read my book, now that you've come to my talk, you know, here's a reading list and here's the people you need to be checking out and here's the people you need to bring in for speeches and here's the, you know, the films that you need to watch and the, and the people that you need to you know, read their books or whatever it is. And I think if we do that, um, we will begin to move towards a place where people can hear truth from, from all sources, not just those that are aesthetically able to fit the bill for them. You know? um, I'll do one more real quick. That was a great one. Yeah, go there. Yeah, it's great. Right, right. No, I think it's, I think it's really important that um, th what real solidarity means to me is that you have to be willing to get into those conversations that are uncomfortable, particularly uh, uncomfortable with the very people that you're supposedly acting in solidarity with. And so if I'm going to be in solidarity with, let's say, black and brown folk, I, I can't simply sort of choose the three or four people um, who I think say really important stuff and just promote their work or, or, or steer people to them or engage with them. I also have to be prepared to hear from people who are gonna challenge me and challenge other white folks, including being willing to hear, even if I, even if I choose to disagree, because it's fine to disagree. A white person is not obligated to agree with everything a person of color says just because they say it. But I have to at least be willing to hear those people of color, for instance, who say basically F white allies, right? Like, we don't need them, don't want them, y'all just go do your thing, leave us alone to do our thing. Like, I, I have to be willing to hear that, even if I disagree with it, and even if I think that probably isn't strategically going to work, I still need to listen to what that is and understand where that comes from and then figure out, okay, what's the most responsive way and responsible way for me to deal with someone who feels that way? Because, I, you know, because that feeling comes from an understandable place, right? That, that feeling comes from a place of having been burned, many, many, many times by people who aspired to be and maybe even intended to be really strong allies and act in solidarity. So if someone says, forget it, I don't want you, I don't need you, then okay, it doesn't mean you quit. I mean, in fact, if the white person quits just because a person of color says, we don't want you, then you were never really down anyway, right? Like actually, actually if I just say like, okay then, I'm out, right? Then clearly what I've just done is I've just, I didn't want to do the work to begin with. But it does mean that I can't keep pushing into your space. If, you, if that's how you feel, I gotta at least sit with the tension there. I gotta sit with what that, why does that trigger me? Why does that get me upset, right? And all of us who are trying to be allies, and not just white folks around race, men around, around gender, and folks who have a little bit of money around class, and people that are straight around, I mean, all, there are always gonna be marginalized people that are like, yeah, forget all y'all, we don't need you. And, and you can't get defensive and walk out when that happens, you have to be willing to sit with that tension and think about what it means and then figure out, okay, why is someone saying that? And if I know why they're saying it, then maybe I can alter the behavior that creates that feeling, right? And, and, do, and at least do my part. Whereas if I'm just hanging out with the people that say the same stuff that I'm saying the same way I'm saying it, then I'm clearly not gonna do that. So I, you, know, you have to put yourself in uncomfortable spaces um, and be willing to not make it all about yourself when you do it. That means that when someone challenges, you don't go cry and whine about it. You know, you just sort of sit with it. You can push back. You can, you can, you can discuss it. You know, like I said, you don't have to just be a punching bag when someone goes after you, but you do need to at least sit with it and, and show some willingness to, to ingest it and take it into your body and, 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 and deal with it um, in, a, in a forthright manner. One more real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I just, I always say one more and then I'm just, I'm trying to get asylum, y'all. The longer I stay the more likely this is going to happen. So I'm just, there's a, there's a method to this. Trust me. Yes, go ahead. I just want to know, uh, does an anti-racism speaker such as yourself spend most of his time doing what he did tonight and preaching to the choir? I think, I think you can tell from the sort of the, the murmurs in the crowd. 
Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. That's probably true. That's a safe bet. Um, I, I think a couple things. Um, I think, first of all, I'm from the South, and by that I mean the American South. And so I've been around a lot of choirs. <laughs> and one thing I know about choirs um, is that they need a lot of practice. Because sometimes you're amongst the choir, and they, they, all, they think they sound great. And they're not even singing the same hymn from the, from the hymnal. So, so I've been around enough choirs to know, like, even if that's all it is, and I don't assume that's what it always is. In fact, I know often it's not. I know sometimes it's very much not the choir. Now, granted, I, I don't get asked to go to speak at CPAC and, you know, the Conservative Political Action Conference. And, and, uh, and there aren't enough drugs to probably get me to take that invitation if they offered it to me, because I'm not that much of a masochist. Um, but uh, I do certainly speak in front of audiences that are not nearly as friendly as this one, and, um, and I'm happy to do it when I do it. But I do think that sometimes, you know, those of us who are sort of on the same page or sort of at least like-minded philosophically in, in, in a particular direction still need some practice and we need a tune-up and we need an analysis. That, and, and that's why I go to stuff you know, from people who, who I already sort of know what they're going to say, but I like to hear things differently and I like to sort of put things in different perspective and have all these different analyses that I can sort of put together from a diagnostic perspective about looking at where we are as a society. Um, and I think sometimes that's undervalued because we spend so much time politically in both of our respective countries, I gather, certainly it's true in mine, assuming that the work is the work of conversion, right? So it's about sheep stealing from your church into my church. It's about saying, I'm going to take you, conservative or reactionary person, and all of a sudden make you a liberal or something. Or I was going to say make a conservative a progressive, but apparently y'all have that is the same thing here, <laughs> which I don't, know, I don't know how that even works. I, I, the, I mean, it's like the progressive, it's like the tall short party. I don't understand. I don't understand it. I mean, they seem perfectly lovely. I just don't understand how they get these words. I, anyway, that's, you know what I mean. Um, so I, I, it's not about conversion. It's not about taking conservatives, making them liberal, or for people who are conservative, I don't think it ought to be for them about taking people who are liberal and making them conservative. Because look, the research on brain science is very clear. Very few people are going to ever change their ideological predisposition based on a fact that you give them or an analysis. People don't actually come to our politics based on facts. We don't do it based on research. We don't do it based on evidence. We don't do it based on, oh my God, I read this really amazing book or I saw this really great speech and it changed my whole way of thinking. I mean, honestly, when was the last time you were in a political debate or argument with someone and you gave them evidence and they were like, holy hell, I've been wrong my entire life. Like that has never happened to any of us. And the reason is we come to our politics based on stuff that really isn't about that. It's about stories and narrative and our experiences and even some stuff, this is frightening, biologically encoded in us that leads us to be predisposed to one or another viewpoint so, or one another set of viewpoints. So I think sometimes while we're trying to do all this conversion, what we're missing is that politics is about mobilization. And it's about that much more so than flipping people from one side to another. Yes, at election time, there's always that group of undecided people that parties fight over. I get that. But in terms of movements, it's really not what it is. In terms of movements, we need to be thinking very much like, frankly, in the United States in 1988, famously, a guy by the name of Ralph Reed, who was the head of the Christian Coalition, um, which was this evangelical, you know, Christian right organization, mostly focused on issues of, of uh, the issue of abortion. And, and this was even before marriage equality was even really on the radar screen. So they were mostly about, you know, so-called family values, but only certain types of families and only certain values. And, and, and Ralph Reed famously said, this was an organization that had been co-founded by Pat Robertson, the televangelist. Ralph Reed, who was the director, said famously in 1988, we don't need, or it might have been 1990, but right around that time, he said, we don't need the majority to be on our side. All we need is about 
of the American people to really be committed to our side because the rest of the country will be at home watching Falcon Crest, which was, you know, a TV show back in the day for those old enough to remember it. Nowadays, we would say they'd be home watching Netflix or they'd be home binge watching something, you know, uh, or, or on social media. But the idea he was basically articulating was we just need like 6% to be really viscerally involved, constantly committed, and everybody else is just sort of going to go along. We can just steamroll them. Now, that's a horrible kind of mentality. It's a very anti-democratic, small d, anti-democratic mentality. But the reality is, he wasn't wrong. The reason that the right gained as much power in the United States as it did after that period of time, and I would say the reason that we are where we are now in my country, is that the right knew it was about mobilization. And the left thinks it's about making really good arguments. Right, because uh, be real honest, it's like some self critique about liberals and leftists. Like, we have this unhealthy faith in the power of pure reason. We really do. We just actually think that reason is what matters to people, and it just isn't. And so, so we end up being the debate team party, and the other side are the cheerleaders, right? Well, who gets people riled up the most? The cheerleaders or the debaters? People are like, I can't listen to this. This is too complicated. But someone's over there going, woohoo! And everybody's like, yes, I'm all for that, you know? And so, and so really and truly, I think we got to stop worrying about whether it's the choir, because sometimes if we're mobilizing the quote unquote choir and practicing, because like I said, choirs need practice, then that's actually how we win things. That's actually how movements operate. The civil rights movement didn't really convert a lot of segregationists. You know, the women's movement didn't really convert a lot of hardcore sexist and misogynist. The labor movement didn't convert a lot of capitalists. You know, the labor movement didn't get a lot of bosses to go, I'm totally down, I'm gonna go on strike with you. That just didn't happen. Like, they tried to kill them. They did, in many cases, kill them. Segregationists tried to kill the civil rights movement. And for the most part, if you look at the polling, the needle didn't really move that much during those movements. Now, in retrospect, we don't see that because now you look back and we have this, like, for Dr. King, we have you know, whose 50th anniversary of his murder is coming up in about um, a week and a half. Um, he's now a secular saint, right? Um, but he was certainly not while he was alive. And even the week after he was assassinated, Pohl found that the majority of white folks thought he was a more divisive figure than a uniting figure, and he had been a net negative for the country. So we've only recreated this mythology that everybody was on board. They, they weren't. They were ineluctably hostile. And yet they still got some stuff done. And the reason they got stuff done was because they out-organized and they out-mobilized and they took the choir and they, and, they, and they made the choir powerful and they trained them to sing on key, metaphorically speaking, and they were able to steamroll the other side. And sometimes, as messy and ugly as that is, that's actually how politics works. It would be great if we could just all come to the table and have a conversation at the end of it go, wow, you had the better argument, so now I believe this. And unfortunately, what the research says is it just isn't how it works. So while we might want to try to evolve to that species someday, and maybe we'll get there, um, right now we're literally in a war for our lives, those who believe in justice and are fighting for justice. And those who are on the other side are very clear about what their intentions are, and they are very, very motivated. And if that means drilling down on one or two issues and hammering those all the time and voting only on those issues, that's what they'll do. I mean, in the United States, you see that right now. The reason, I know some people are baffled by the willingness of, let's say, evangelical Christians to stick with Donald Trump, who violates every precept of individual personal morality that these folks have preached for decades. Uh, it violates openly at least two of the Ten Commandments that they supposedly believe in and want posted everywhere, let alone the ones that we don't know he's violating, but probably is. Um, and yet they stick with them, and people don't understand why. Well, you want to know why? It's not real complicated. Uh, the reason is, and they'll tell you this when you, when you actually get down to it, is because he's going to remake the courts and he's going to get rid of abortion. And, that's, and they are literally so committed to that one issue, as well as maybe the issue of rolling back uh, LGBTQ rights. But it's th these, these handful of sexual politic issues and culture war issues are so important to them that they will embrace someone who violates every norm of their behavior just for the sake of power just for the sake of winning. And so all this stuff about there's a morality behind the religious, there's no individual morality. It is all about winning. If they are doing everything that they're doing for the sake of winning and we're sitting around trying to win arguments, I promise you, I know who will win and, and I know who will lose. And it won't be the people who want a more just and equitable society who, who succeed. It'll be the people that are mobilized. And so I'm okay talking to the choir. I'd love to talk to other people, but sometimes I gotta tell you the truth, I don't want the other people knowing what we're plot plotting. 
I don't want them really knowing what we have in store. You know, like, y'all just go on and stay away. That's fine. We'll do our thing, you know. Uh, and then we'll meet y'all on the battlefield, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. So anyway, thank you all so much. I've kept you long enough. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I know that we could go on and on and listen to Tim all night, um, but he does have a plane to catch in the morning. But we do want to thank you again for thank coming, you. um, you. your words and your thought-provoking you so thoughts. Much. And hopefully, as we're standing here, I was looking at the, um, the sign, and for those who are here, and Tim, you may know yeah. that last week we revealed the, uh, the $10 bill, and on the banner it says, A New Direction. And the title of his talk tonight was about allyship and co-collaboration. And I hope that some of the takeaways that you'll have from tonight is really kind of thinking and doing some self-reflection on what is it that you can do to be an ally? What is the new direction that you're going to be taking? And then connect. And so how do we actually move forward together? So I want to thank you. Thank you for coming. And Good night. And I'd also want to just remind everybody that there is a reception um, just down the hall. Um, and if you'd like to, uh, to meet Tim, he'll be there um, afterwards. So thank you so. again. Thank you.